We are on tape two, and we're now on the law school experience. Uh, tell us about uh, uh, law school. Well, we got accepted at, at, at all four schools that we applied at, um, and chose University of Utah because we were Utah residents, tuition factor did factor in. Uh, UT was the, the, the grandest school. It's ranked number 15 in the nation right now. At that time, I don't know. But uh, tuition made a difference. Went to UT, uh, University of Utah. Uh, that means we moved from BYU up to um, Salt Lake City. Um, and, and, and law school was overwhelming. It was intimidating. It was hard for me. I, I studied hard. I stuck with it. And uh, I had a pattern. I'd be at law school all day, come home at about 5, uh, I'd be with uh, Sarah and uh, our little baby, which was Stephen, stay home until about 7.30, from 5 to about 7.30, that's two and a half hours, eat and play and relax and enjoy. Went back to the law school till it closed, which is 11 o'clock. Came back home, or 10.30, but I mean at 11 o'clock, came home. Sarah and I would, be laying on the, would lay on the floor there, listen to some really soft classical music that we had purchased and play Scrabble. That was one of those things, we played Scrabble. Um, a law school was a hard thing for me. It was not pleasant. I didn't do it right. I didn't have any study buddies. Uh, no relatives in school with me. I didn't socialize much. I was always more interested in getting home. Once in a while I would come home. Uh, no, I take it back. Regularly I would come home in the middle of the day. Truth of the matter is, I always did, come to think of it. Uh, lunch, visit with Sarah, see the baby. Yeah. Be at law school, come home at 11.30, 12, 12.30. Back to school till 5. Home until uh, 7.30, back to school till 11. It was a nice schedule. Uh, law school was hard. End of the first year, um, I was to go up in the Northwest to paint bridges. I needed somehow, I don't know why, maybe I didn't need, but they gave us our grades. Um, and they gave our grades, well they gave us our grades. I'm not going to say they gave us our grades early, they gave us our grades. That's it. It was a horrible experience, this was so bad that all of my grades were passing, and, and in law school you had to maintain a C average, and that's just about what most of them did, barely. And I forgot what class it was, but it was a D instead of a C, and my others were C's, straight C's, no B's. And it was a D, I forgot what class it was, but it was a horror experience because it threw me out of law school. Now we knew that a fairly good percentage of kids would uh, not make it through law school. And incidentally, Dan, as it turns out, 45% of the starting class did not graduate. Some quit of their own, others were forced to quit. We were one of them that was forced to quit. We failed out. I say we, I failed out. We were really distraught. It was painful, it was embarrassing. Um, but we still needed to survive, meaning we had to get the job. Didn't have it around there, I needed to go where the money was, we were to go up to, into the Northwest. So we disposed of all of our belongings in that little apartment. And this was happening within a day or two. Uh, getting the grades was sickening, and then disposing of all of our furniture uh, to the point where all of our belongings would fit in a small utility trailer which we were to pull behind a moderately old car, Chevy, up into the Northwest. So our furniture stuff was only slightly worth more than giving it away. We, and it was nearly a tier point where we was gathering up our stuff and putting it in uh, the car because it wasn't just moving away, it was moving away somewhat in shame and having failed and not knowing what to do next. And constantly my mind was like, what do I do next? Well, maybe I'll go on into education. Maybe even insurance work. So we left the Y. 
I mean, at University of Utah, and traveled on up into the uh, Northwest, and that was a painful experience in itself because the car was unreliable. Uh, and as I recall, as we were traveling up into the mountains, up, uh, it's the Rocky Mountains, up towards Seattle, for some reason the car quit. And it was up in the mountains, and we were desperate. We was able to pull off the road. Finally it started, and we were able to proceed on. Um, going around a corner, not speeding, I'm pulling a trailer, but the trailer tipped right over on account of the corner in the mountains. The trailer just tipped over, came off the ball, it was a ball hitch, the chains held together, drug the trailer away from there. We are out there in the middle of this road that's up in the mountains. It's rather scary uh, because of traffic, not a whole lot of traffic, but some traffic, mountain traffic. Um, and there Sarah is heavy pregnant with the child who become Stan. Uh, the child was born about three or four weeks later. But she was heavy pregnant. We're up there in the mountains having failed out of law school. Old car and all of our belongings in one trailer. All of them. The rest was given away or sold for $10 or something. The trailer's tipped over. We heard glass falling to the floor. I couldn't lift the trailer up. A great big truck, 18-wheeler, pulled over, stopped. The man got out. The two of us straightened the trailer up. We heard some more glass fall into the floor, it was up to the pavement, it was to the point where we didn't care anymore. And we were going, preparing to go on to no man's land. We didn't know where. We didn't have a job waiting. But we had a promise of a job, or at least, uh, no, not a promise of a job, a hope for a job. And hope would incidentally carry us so far. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Well, the trailer, we got it back on the ball and secured the chains proceeded right on. Not, didn't care what was broken inside. Made it to Seattle, went on to, uh, made it to Seattle and uh, fortunately landed the job that we had hoped for. I had a brother up there, Ben, that uh, <coughs> was painting bridges and he would steer us uh, and told us by telephone prior to come on up and he would see if he could help us make the connections. Got the job, and uh, we were sent to a town called Richmond. Uh, there's a Tri-Cities, Richmond, Pasco, Kennewick. Stan was born in Kennewick. And uh, there I painted bridges. And um, Sarah, uh, it was a rough experience because from where our apartment was, she could see me painting. She could see me on the bridge as a high steel man. And she thought in her mind each day how she would handle life if I fell to my death. It was hard on her, I know, because she kind of calloused herself that what if I fall and then she's left a widow with two children there. That's what she went through. I forgot was, to tell you. Was it dangerous work? It was just extremely dangerous. I'll come to that. I forgot to tell you that up, up on the mountain when... Um, things fell apart for us. It was a painful time and she and I about to simultaneously I thought of that song Come Come Ye Saints because we were trying to build our own little kingdom and things were falling apart. Fortunately she was totally supportive. She never accused me, why didn't you study harder? No. She, whatever lot befell her and us she rallied behind me and was totally supportive but yet she quietly help steer us, to, to build us. Then back up on that bridge, um, what was your question? I just asked if it was dangerous work. Oh, it was It was just ultra dangerous. <clears throat> As a high man, you go up, there's no net under the bridge, today there are, and we were not, uh, there were no belts. We were not hooked to the steel. We were just literally climbing it. And if you slip, hope you got it you hope you have a good grip, which did happen all too often. And it was just extremely dangerous, so dangerous that I wouldn't have uh, our children do it. Uh, adult children, I would do everything I could to dissuade them. 
I mean, it's a... You would literally just climb on the outside of a bridge and start painting? Mm-hmm. Well, sometimes we'd be standing on a plank, and sometimes not standing on a plank. But to get up to the top, you had to actually... Just literally climb up. The big I-beam, the big, uh, I don't even know what you call it, but it's kind of like beams, but they... The big arched support arched beams. Arched supports. You literally climb them all the way up, and uh, you better have good balance. And then when you're up there, you stand up, and you paint, and you paint walking backwards. And oh, I could go on into that, which we don't need to do here. But she was supportive. And but she knew all that, and obviously it worried her. Daily, because she could see me up there. I wouldn't put her through that again. She could see me up there. She's thinking, I hope. And then really quickly, let me share, because she had such an experience, a painful experience. I'm up on the, it's a holiday. I think it's July 4, I'm not sure. It's either a holiday or it's Saturday. And I'm working and I do have a helper, so it was planned from Friday. And without going into detail about how it happened, I fall from the bridge. And this is from the uh, Kennewick Pasco Bridge into the Columbia River, which is the big Columbia River, and which was uh, had, had a reputation of having torrents. It was noted for its torrents and its currents and uh, drownings. Well, I fell into the Columbia River. Did you fall five, ten feet? Nope, it was 40 feet, but the way it was, I was up. I don't want to spend too much time on the details of this, but I was up under the deck of the bridge, and I was standing on top of one of the pier platforms that, and these piers are so huge that you can stand on them, and the structural steel that goes up above it and supports the whole bridge, you can stand right there and paint and everything, and I was working, and um, I got pulled off by a cable, and I fell. Now, this bridge, like many of them, if you can think of the Golden Gate Bridge, has a lot of structural steel under the bridge to help support the bridge. As strange as that may sound, you may think it might pull it down, but it's the structural steel is built in such a way that it helps support the bridge. Well, about 20 feet from the deck of the bridge, or at least from the top of the pier where I was standing, there's about 20 feet before that structural steel. Or before well, the that's bottom. roughly two stories. And then about 20 more feet from there to the water. <coughs> So when I fell, a uh, strange thing can happen when a person falls. They, they can see and they can think. And I saw that structural steel just coming rushing up toward me. In other words, I was coming toward it. And I instinctively spun and flipped like a cat will when you, if you throw a cat up in the air. And when I spun, because I saw it coming toward my face, it got me right in the back, right in the rump, which is about the safest place to get hit hard. It was on the low back and on the side by the hip rump. I hit that real hard after a 20 foot fall and bounced and tumbled and right on down into the water. And when I hit that water I remember thinking I hope I come up. Well I did come up. And I noticed that I came up and I was glad. That my body felt numb but my arms and legs were working. I caught the attention of um, my helper up there, and he threw a rope down. I got a hold of the rope, and he walked clear from about the center of the bridge where we were, clear to the end of the bridge, and pulled me along in the water because I couldn't swim. At least, I didn't think I could swim. I didn't even try because I couldn't feel, because I was numb from getting hit so hard. Oh, if it had hit me in the head, I'd have been a goner. It would have knocked me out. So he pulled me to the shore. Now here's where your mother comes in. He pulled me to the shore, we get out, and I don't think an ambulance got me. I think somebody stopped and picked me up and took me to the hospital. Small town, only one hospital, and it was a small one. Took me in the hospital. Lo and behold, unbeknownst to me, Sarah was there at the hospital. She was there making scheduling the birth of Stan. That's why she was there. 
But when I came into the hospital, a nurse, already knowing that Sarah Packard was there, quickly heard that Bernard Packard just came in as a patient and said to Sarah, something like, is Bernard Packard your husband? Yes. He has just fallen from the bridge and landed on his face. Naturally, she was petrified. She thought I was a goner. She thought when she saw me, it would be that I was going to die. I mean, that's what went through her mind right then. And she came in and saw me, and I was either on my feet or in a wheelchair, come up and she hugged me and she saw I was going to be all right. I was not hurt that bad. But that just confirmed in her mind how dangerous it was, and uh, she expected... Uh, me to fall to my death. And parenthetically, I might just say, although this was not in her mind, uh, but just to illustrate how, how bad it is, a year later, the very following summer, my older brother Ben, my plank partner, did fall to his death. Not in the Columbia River, but he fell from the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Tacoma, Washington, and fell to his death. That's another story which doesn't impact on Sarah and her history, but <clears throat> but Sarah got to know Ben and his wife Ann and their four little girls really quite well. We all did. I was not his plank partner when he fell, nor was he mine when I fell. But uh, my painting career of bridges pretty much came to a close then. And when I came down here, I painted towers. That's a bit dangerous. But Sarah really went through the ringer up there in Washington. Back to what Law did school. it? What did it? Um, that entire experience. Uh, what was her demeanor like? How did she? You're out of law school. You're. Yeah. Uh, she was submissive. Sarah. Early in marriage, was a different Sarah than later. Early, she was submissive. She was a sweetie. She was light-footed. She was spry, gay fun, laughter, and supportive, and yet she had a serious mind and was also sober and was really bright. Later in life, she was a war horse. She was quite strong. She was not bullheaded. She was very independent-minded and um, not judgmental, not really opinionated, but she was very self-assured. Um, she was not so dependent on me because she was a take charge lady and um, knew that she could get things done with her own wit and will. She was a stronger lady and much more independent later on in her life than to begin with. Maybe we're all a bit that way. But how did she handle it up there? She leaned on me and followed me and kind of like her own mother said to her before Sarah was married to her. It was kind of an interesting thing that I learned only later. This is why we were engaged and we were in a house. I think it was Grandma's house, Vivian's house. Vivian said to Sarah, Sarah, you don't have to follow him everywhere, especially not on into the bathroom. And that's because she liked me and liked to be with me and just follow me around. And I probably followed her around, but we were special friends. Well, uh, did you ever hear from the law school again? Well, what happened, we went up there and I was working and struggling, and it was Sarah and I both struggling, what do we do next? But we were both busy, she was busy preparing to give birth to Stan and then giving birth to Stan and then supporting and raising loving Stan so she was very busy and I was busy working earning money not sure what I was going to do and lo and behold after having been up there for between four and six weeks a letter came from the University of Utah saying alright now Sarah got the letter and as I recall she didn't open it I get home from work 
we open it together, and lo and behold, it says, after having read all the examinations and rescoring them, your grade in such and such a class is a C. In other words, here's your new grade. It was life altering. It just blew our mind. Everything changed. We were back in law school. It was like a new world to us. Oh, we just hugged and jumped and danced and Stan was already born and this was, this was big. This was new. We were back in law school. We had survived quite a painful time in our life and uh, it was a new beginning for us. We finished painting and actually I got injured and I could have brought my painting career to a close. But the, the boss, maybe for an ulterior reason, he, he was good to me, he liked me. He, he liked my work and my, my output. So, but maybe also to avoid a lawsuit, I'm not sure. But he said, I want you back on the job. I want you to sit there in this soft chair. I want you to watch around and make sure everybody's doing their job and you're paid full salary. And you just relax and stay in that chair as long as you need to. Two weeks, four weeks, till you go back to school, whatever it takes. And so I did. I went back on the job and I just sat there and I watched. And then after about 10 days, two weeks, I was up and at it again. But it was different. I was spooked, so I couldn't paint very well. I mean, I, I just couldn't operate <clears throat> like a monkey climbing that steel. I was spooked. And so I, I did it for about two weeks or so or three weeks. And then I had kind of a near slip once and hanging on and it saved me. And I said, that's it. And it was a week before I needed to. It was a week before I needed to quit in order to go back to the Y, but we quit. Lost a whole week's income, which was a lot of money, but we packed it up. Went back to the Y, back, not the Y, U of U, and back into law school. Well, how'd the second year go? Well, it was the same old, same old, and our schedule was about the same. To school, home for lunch, back to school, home in the evening, loving the two little kiddos, back to the grind, and it was... I guess I didn't learn how to handle law school quite like some of you guys, but I tried. I, I really worked at it hard. And um, and then right at the end, all right, this is what happened. We finished the school year. Then it's time to go work. But we didn't go up in the Northwest. We were already a married couple. We came down south. And I got a job right away painting steel, but this time it was steel tanks, the big round tanks, oil tanks at the refinery, which is still a little bit dangerous, but not much. Nothing compared to cat walking on top of a bridge. Oh, no, not much at all. In fact, most, uh, a lot of my work was on, on the ground, a little bit was on scaffolds, and it wasn't all painting. Some of it was cleaning out the inside of these big oil tanks, which is chemical residue on the ground. And I didn't care as long as uh, they keep me busy and I pay. And my body was in good shape. But after doing this for about four weeks, we received our grades from the second year of U of U. And lo and behold, it was a bad report. Just about destroyed us. All of the grades were C except for one in property, it was a D. And it was so horrible. So let me share how this was and how it impacted on Sarah and how she impacted on me. It was a clear cut grade and we, we hoped that it also was a mistake. But it was a final report, report card. And it was a D and uh, I didn't I hadn't maintained the, B, the C average and we were out of law school again. After two years, it's a three-year school, after two years we were out of law school again. And, oh, I forgot to tell you. <clears throat> I received the, the paper and I don't know why, this time I opened it myself without Sarah's being nearby. I guess because, you know, I'm nervous. And I read it. 
and I failed. But <clears throat> that very next day, we had a family outing with Marshall Hayes and Sarah and I. Ooh, I can't remember if her folks were involved or not. I don't think they went on. And this outing was a deep sea fishing trip, 100 miles out into the ocean. And I didn't want to mess up Sarah's mind by telling her about this. So I didn't tell her. I kept it quiet. And we went out deep sea fishing, and Marshall and I got just deathly sick, but Sarah and I and all of us, we had a grand time. Deep sea fishing, catching red snapper. Came back, it was a whole day trip, day and a night. Came back, and we had a family outing and good recreation, and um, I still didn't tell her till all of that was over, and then I shared it with her. And we grieved together, and we wondered, what do we do next? Two years have gone by. This is a, a final grade. Uh, the miracle isn't going to happen again like it did when we was up in Washington. We get another grade later. Um, and poor Sarah, she she felt bad for me. She didn't even begin to like reprimand me or criticize or you should have da da da. But she was just totally supportive and hugged me and said something will come up. Um, we'll do something and uh, so she really took it well she's a great woman I might just say she rallied behind me and helped me we got on that telephone the very next day after our weekend family vacation we got on the telephone communicating with University of Utah the Dean's office and started checking with the various law schools down here checked U of U I mean, I checked the University of Texas, UT, which had previously accepted me, and I made my plea with them. They were not interested. The University of Houston, I made my plea with them. They were not interested. Uh, I checked with, with um, Texas Southern University in Houston. They were not interested, but they said, come and see us and we'll talk. But for reasons that you know about it, it has something to do with ethnic uh, eth ethnic principles. Uh, it was not my choice, but I'd go there if I had to. It's the black school. Um, I think I checked with another school, either in Dallas or somewhere. But I uh, checked with South Texas College of Law. So I'm back on the phone with the University of Utah, and I can't get anybody to, to budge. And South Texas College of Law informed me that if they could get a le if I could get a letter declaring that I was in good standing, South Texas would accept me. But I wasn't in good standing. I had failed out. So Sarah was right by me, and we were working, and we were commiserating, and we were um, strategizing and trying to figure out how to do this. And she helped me figure out get back on the phone with you of you, the dean, and persuade them to, no matter what, send a letter of good standing. Now, Sarah was right with me there because I needed her help so badly because she was smart when it came to things like this. She and I learned that we were talking to the assistant dean. The assistant dean let it out that the dean was gone, that he was harder than he himself was. He, he's tougher. Then, <clears throat> this was a second or third phone call up there, and then the assistant dean said this. These phone calls came within hours of each other, and within the second day that we started, on the second day that we started this real fast, we learned that the, the assistant dean said, I could see some daylight. The grades are not officially posted yet. And until they're officially posted, by law, we're required to rely on the grades that have been posted, which is your past grades. And so theoretically and technically, 
you're in good standing until the dean gets back, which he will Monday, and posts the grades. And, and, and Sarah was hearing this too. And we said, said, please send us the letter of good standing at once. Because if technically and theoretically I'm still in good standing, you, you morally and legally and ethically can send that letter. And then we have to deal with any problem after that if I needed something later on. But you could send it, and, and he was persuaded. And he sent a letter of good standing right to South Texas College of Law. I went over there, and, and the dean said, it's good enough. We're not going to accept your D but we'll, uh, for transfer purposes, but we will accept to your C's. And so they wouldn't accept the D. That was uh, in my favor, of course. I had to take property over, and I'm back in law school. That was big. Sarah um, helped me through that whole thing because it was too hard to carry that alone, and she had wisdom and good judgment, and uh, we kind of like steered each other through it, and to me it was another miracle. It was big. It changed our whole life again because I already had a feeling that South Texas for my senior year would be a little bit easier. And as it turned out, it was about a half a grade easier. That is, I could go from a C to basically in each class to a C plus. Uh, I got, I think, a couple of Bs or a couple of B minuses. So that was my third year. And it was a new world for Sarah. Where did you live? Well, we lived in uh, the south edge of Houston, down by uh, the zoo. It's called Herman Park Zoo. We lived within a quarter of a mile or less, eighth of a mile of the Herman Park Zoo in an apartment complex. Um, Steve and Stan, and then David was born in the middle of my uh, senior year. Uh, I commuted from there to South Texas College of Law which was an eight-minute run. I forgot where I parked the car daily, but it was obviously a parking lot. Maybe I had to pay for it. I had it down to a routine. I studied faithfully. And I reviewed these books, these health set books, Gibla, uh, Gilbert's, Gilbert's books on classes that I knew would turn up on the bar exam that I could not take because no time and on um, all the classes uh, preparing for the bar exam. Anyway, Sarah was having a heyday. That third year, she loved it because I was in law school. She could see I was doing all right because we'd already got some grades back at the mid semester. At, uh, after the first semester, she got a new baby. She was healthy, happy. It was a great year for us. Strangers, we made friends. Strangers to other people, but we made friends. Yeah. Um. Passed the bar exam? Yeah, yeah, we uh, we passed school fine, took the bar exam, and uh, parenthetically I might say we did well on the bar exam. Uh, uh, out of our school, not out of the state of Texas, but out of our school, I tied for second high. Uh, there was another person that went on ahead of us on the bar exam, but for second high, I tied with another student, and so I did well on the bar exam and uh, jumped right in. Where did you go after you graduated? Well, um, incidentally, at the graduation exercise, it was Wade and Vivian came to the graduation exercise. That was it. And, uh, I think that's all we invited. Um, <clears throat> came out here to Viter, and I opened shop in Viter. We rented a little rent house from Wade and Vivian Hayes that they've got, and it was pay. It was rent now and pay later. $50 a month. We didn't even have the money to pay monthly, so we paid later. And um, I opened a little office in Viner. Uh, Sarah stayed home with the kids. And um, How did you market? Well, I, I just word of mouth. I watched for a chance to get into a, an established firm, and after eight months, um, I found a trial firm that I was interested in. Carl Wallman, it was called Wallman and Smallwood, approached him. I had some nice injury cases already. He visited with me and he liked me 
like my enthusiasm, personality, and the cases that I had took me in. That was eight months in Vider. I closed that down, came to Beaumont, joined his firm, and uh, became a trial lawyer. Um, Sarah was having a good time by then because she was seeing some money, and she was a happy girl, and little kiddos, and close to her folks, and uh, she and I were crazy in love. It was a good beginning for us. Someone told me that you literally took a board, a plank, and, and a paintbrush and typed and, and painted yourself, Bernie Packard, attorney at law, and hung your shingle that way. Well, it was a little different. Dan, it wasn't even a board. It was cardboard paper. And I put it on the door. And it looked bad. <laughs> it looked real bad because it was hand-painted. And, um, and so we had to get rid of I'm not sure I ever did get a good sign out there, but that was sloppy. That was bad. That's how I marketed it. Um, Grandma or Mom told me that uh, during those that first year after law school, that you guys were really quite poor, and she didn't mind, but that you were so poor that um, some other people took notice and decided to postpone marriage. Really? And she said, she, well, y'all didn't mean to do that. You were just living. I think I heard that. Yeah, rather than go through what you did. I will say this. Uh, the cars that I drove at that time, uh, from my first car, uh, up even through several years of law practice, were junk cars. Literally beat up. And prideful that I might be, I wasn't too proud to drive a beat up car. And Sarah never complained. She was incredible. It was only later in her life that she spent money, and that was always for somebody else, mainly for her girls. But we were poor. But you know, poor that we were, we still had a good life. I mean, a lot of fun. For instance, <clears throat> I was out of law school for only five years we bought the farm. Big house, nice house. And right away after buying it, had it renovated into a very nice big home. The one that later burned down. So, I mean, you've been out of law school longer than that. And you just got your big nice home. We were on the farm, big nice home. We got graduate. I finished in, uh, in 67 and in 72. I heard something about the gleaning apples. Was that while you were in school? Gleaning apples? Ah, that was way back there. <clears throat> you mean the apple orchard incident? Yeah. Well, we found this apple orchard now. And we were gleaning apples, but we found some bushels. And we thought possibly they might be going to waste. But there was about 20 bushels, and they were all brand new beautiful apples and we took uh, not all of them but we took about who's the way of me and Larry and Wendell and Lauren, we took about six or eight bushels and it turned out to be more than we could consume and so we took them to a store a market a grocery store and sold them and we began to feel really bad because we realized that we had stolen those apples but we had been taught a very important principle you pay your tithing on money that you earn, and we did indeed pay tithing on the money we earned from those apples. And we wish now that we could have gone back and paid the orchard owner, but time slipped by. We never made it back there. I feel bad about it, kind of. Um, okay, so... Uh, Initially, you uh, while you're working in Vider and then with uh, the Walnum Smallwood firm, you're there in uh, Grandma and Grandpa's rent house for, what, a couple of years? Yes, about two years. It's a small rent house behind their house, and we loved it. We were in hog heaven, and speaking of hogs, I, I was raised on a farm early years in Idaho, and I, after having gotten through law school, all my inclinations were 
to get back to normalcy, get back to my roots. And I built a hog pen and had some hogs. And, and it was country life. And by then, I had been with Waldman of Smallwood a few months, and I was earning some fairly good money. And our fourth child was born at that time. That was you, Dan Packard. That gave us four boys in a row. David was born while in the middle of our senior year of law school. So you were born while I was working for Walt's Model. And I remember that so vividly because it gave us four sons. Uh, and right at that time, right at that time was when we um, moved from the rent house. We, we settled a case, a right good case that gave me a $4,000 fee. And we bought our first house which is there on Jefferson Street, right next to where John and Priscilla now live. And you were a brand new baby. And I remember distinctly Carl Wallman saying, <clears throat> Bernie, I'd like to see you with a growing family and getting indebted for a home because that means you're sinking your roots deep and you won't be able to leave. He liked me. And uh, I was a trial lawyer for him. I was not a crackerjack person, but he liked me. Um, and so you were our fourth child. We were there living. And before moving into that first home, I do remember, and Sarah was out there, and she loved seeing this. Uh, my riding on the tractor, uh, well, not a, uh, it was a riding lawnmower, pulling behind me. Well, this was four of you. I don't know where it was, but it was pulling you four or five boys behind me on different, and you were all lined up like a train. That was so much fun. We got a picture of it. Um, and I, uh, and then I remember and she was with me out there when she was a little nervous because you kiddos were feeding watermelon to horses, and the horses would get right up to your hand, and he was feeding the watermelon through the fence to these horses. I was a little nervous because, you know, we didn't want you to lose your hand. Well. What was her day like during she, this time period? She, she had four and then finally five boys. She was just totally busy all day. It was, uh, you, like, you, you guys were like toys to her. And she was totally wrapped up in your lives. And she didn't stress. She didn't fret. She just took it all in stride kept her busy. She made clothes. I don't know if she made trousers for you guys. I don't think so. She was expert at shopping. She'd go to flea markets. She would go to thrift shops, thrift stores. And she would get you right good clothes. And we, we were not, especially she was not so prideful that she couldn't go to thrift stores and buy clothes for you, which she would wear to church. Um, she was big on music. She was an expert pianist. And she was super at getting you kids to show off, to be the star, to be out front, and to be center stage. She was excellent at helping you build and, and develop self-confidence, teaching you that nobody was better than you. When you'd come home from work, would she, uh, oh, Bernie, it's been so hard. These kids are driving me crazy. Uh, no, she never did. She had an ability to, um, let's see, this statement, this is saying, don't get caught up in the thick of thin things. She was master at that, just natural as can be, about not getting caught up in the thick of thin things. She knew her priorities. And she was capable of uh, letting go of almost anything to visit with her child. And she saw that as a priority, visiting with her child, um, communicating. She had super communication skills. And especially as your kids got older, teenage years, she, was a, she became a master at communicating with teenagers and young adults. We'll talk about that. That later.
Um, <clears throat> but I'm just really interested because um, I've talked to an awful lot of women in capacity of church work um, who with two or three little kids are just yanking their hair out and they, as soon as the husband get home they want to get out of the house or they, you know, they, they, they it's just all that they can take to take care of those little demanding children during the day and, and I'm certainly not judgmental of, of that, it's a very hard job did she act like that with five active, hyperactive boys? Nope, she didn't. She was cool and calm and collected basically all the time. She didn't get ruffled. She didn't fret or sweat. She didn't get panic-stricken, paranoid, or hardly alarmed. She was calm and collected almost all the time. I come home from work. Fortunately, I was not one to get anxious or riled up if things were not in perfect order when I got home. And also, fortunately, I jumped in and helped her. But I, I don't want to toot my horn or get going down that lane except to say I would take care of feeding, diapers, bathing. She would, uh, I mean, she would do that. She would do it all day long. And, and you know, I knew without her complaining about it, that that's a lot. I mean, I'm not saying she'd be up to her neck on it, but in my mind, she ought to be. So I jumped in and helped. But she focused on uh, personal relationships and developing, you know, talents and skills, tutoring, training, reading. I did help a lot on that, but she did she was excellent at it. It was natural. She loved it. This was her life. She loved the five boys. Did um, did she worry a lot about things like making sure the meals were planned in advance and always hot on the table when you got home or making sure that everything was picked up? Nope. But you know, I never felt slighted on that. And I know that the boys did. See, here we discussed the first born. Marshall came along, and I can't remember if Marshall was born when we lived in the Jefferson Street house or the big house. I think the big house. I could be wrong. He might have made the move with us, but he might have been the first child born after the big house. That is the farm. <clears throat> but she was consumed with the five boys, and they never went hungry. I never felt slighted. Uh, when I came home, if the meal wasn't ready, that was okay by me. I, I helped her. Uh, she, she would prepare meals. We would sit down our evenings. We always sit down at the table together and had a meal together basically every evening. Wednesday evening was the only exception. That's because I was at stake presidency meeting. And I was at stake presidency meeting starting in 1972 when... Um, he was just a little teeny tot. I'm not sure if Marshall was even born yet in 1972. Do you know when Marshall was born? Right about then. I was born in 68. 68? <coughs> Marshall's the very next one. Yeah, but he there was a miscarriage in between us. He's like two years and one or two months. So I don't know what happened first between state presidency and Marshall's birth, but Wednesday night was always church, so Sarah and the kids fend for themselves. But all the other nights, Sunday night, Monday night, all of them, she joined us. We, she, she had a meal ready, and we sat at the table and ate together. Incidentally, how long, were, how many consecutive years were you in the state presidency? Ooh, for 18 years straight, consecutively. But, and Sarah never complained about that Wednesday night. I wouldn't even go home. I would go directly from office to the church meeting. She understood that. She stayed on top of it, fight through it. Now, she had to struggle because it was physical work, but she did it. When it came to discipline, I mean, she was not a very good disciplinarian. She left it to me, and I was cautious. Sometimes she'd call me during the day, and she'd say, Bernie, I don't know what to do. Dan is climbing all over the furniture. He's walking on the walls. And I'd say, well, so sometimes I'd get somebody on the phone and kind of tell them to be fair to their mother. Um, and some, and I mean, this is kind of sad, but sometimes she'd call me at the office and things kind of 
had been out of control. So I would help as much as I could. I had a saying that I used, and that is, you guys, right or wrong, mama's dead right, always. That was to help protect her. And did you know at that time that we would have sometimes lengthy negotiations about that phone? About that phone call? Yeah. Uh-uh. She, she would threaten us with the phone call. Oh, and then you tried to negotiate. And we'd negotiate, and sometimes we'd win, and sometimes she'd win. Oh, man. No, I didn't. <laughs> I'll say this. It is mighty hard to beat Sarah as a mother. And it's also mighty hard to beat her as a wife. Sarah's the best thing that ever came to my life. Um, and she was a master at being a mother and just absolutely super as being a wife. She was a wonderful wife. She and I had a, a warm, wonderful relationship. And it was fun. All these, when all the kids were young, it was fun. She enjoyed them. She had a special talent, and that was enjoying every moment at the moment. It, she was not one to continually look forward, look ahead for the next stage. She enjoyed every stage. And as she told me one time, even from pre-high school, she enjoyed every stage and the following stage was always more fun. Isn't that a master? Is that some philosophy? All right, what else? Why did y'all uh, have so many children? I don't know. I, I think it's because we didn't think about it. We didn't assess the cost. We didn't assess the workload. And I didn't have to talk her into it. And it was like as though she believed in it, and I believed in it, and it just kind of came naturally. It's like, why does one have the third child? Well, you could say, well, because that's a good number and they want to. Well, I don't have a good explanation. I've thought about that. Why did we have from, say, a eighth child to 13? It might have been that I believe you get more stars in heaven, but I don't believe that anymore. The reason I don't believe that anymore is that would be unfair to little Rochelle, who's already passed away. I actually don't believe it anymore. There's a scripture about it. The Lord will bless you with what, for the good you would have done. I mean, Joseph asked our Heavenly Father about his brother Alvin. And the Lord will bless you for the good you would have done. So, I don't know why. Maybe it's because my mama did. I sure wish there were more people that thought that children were an heritage unto the Lord. Yeah, there's a scripture about that. Um, about financially prepared, you turn it on, you, you, you leave on. me off, okay? Okay, Dad, uh, we talked about the move to the new house, the five boys. Well, then you get uh, Rochelle, Rebecca, Priscilla, Elizabeth, Samuel, and then Michael. Uh, there's a, a lot of time there, but it's a busy time in her life. So you uh, have a responsible uh, church assignment. You have a career. And she's got now 9, 10, then 11 children. Tell me uh, what life was like during that time period. Um, those were golden years. Partly because I was in pretty big money by then. Um, I was making... Seventy-five thousand dollars to one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars each year, and <clears throat> and and Sarah, uh, she took a free hand in in that money. In other words, she would clean out my wallet, she would clean out my pockets because I always left money in my pockets, coat pockets, sometimes pet pockets, and I would sometimes do it for her. I would sometimes do it just for myself, but she had no qualms. Incidentally. She had no qualms about taking all of it right out of the wallet. And 
I never did get after her for it. Um, and I would slip money, sometimes a hundred dollar bill at a time, right down her dress into her bosom, and she would insist that I do it that way because she knew it meant money and you know it was personal and it was loving and all this. Those were golden years for her, especially with the first girl, Rochelle. She was just, I mean, it was like the greatest day of her life again, a girl. And naturally, she was just gorgeous and beautiful, and as, as a first girl always would be. Um, and then she got the girls going on their music, and you guys were singing and showing off and singing and on stage, all these things. And we've got plenty of video on, on, on you fellas doing these things as the five. Um, and then the girls come along and she's got them in violin and piano and just started in voice. Rochelle had a, a rather high soprano voice and it was what, what, what Sarah called our songbird. It was pretty. As an almost nine-year-old girl just before the house fire, her voice was really coming through nice. Uh, Rebecca was so good on the violin. Rochelle was good on the piano. She was, she was gifted. And uh, Priscilla and Elizabeth starting on the violin. Um, she was making dresses for them. We were traveling, going on trips, conferences, Mexico. Uh, we built a swimming pool, kids swimming pool daily. It's a big farm, dead end street, no traffic threat. Loved the big house, a lot of space. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, Priscilla uh, introduced into this new world of ours, beauty pageants. She entered some Vider uh, barbecue festival pageant when she was 12 years old, won it. And I didn't even know she entered it, didn't go there. Uh, learned later on that she entered the pageant and won it. And that introduced pageants into her life. Uh, Sarah took that principle and really kept because she and then I also, but especially she, believed in the talent competition because it develops everything about a person. The interview and then of course the talent, uh, the musical talent or whatever it is. And then the, the beauty and the walking and the stage walk, the grace and everything that goes with it. She made the most of that. So that, <clears throat> those were big years for her. Um, active in the church. I was still doing the same thing in church, but I was home most of the week. Those were good good years for us. 